Okay, so uh, now that Dennis is here, we'll get started. And uh, this is, as Jason said, the carefully planned, well-orchestrated family of eight annual meeting. We do have eight, count them, uh, seven and a half or something, I don't know if you, <laughs> anyhow. Um, what we do each year is get together and just kind of babble a little bit about what we've been doing or not doing or what we hope to do. And um, people will introduce themselves as they go. Even though it's OS8, we're going to be interrupt driven. So if you guys have anything that is relevant or of interest or even mildly obscene, feel free to jump in, except for John. Yes, sir. Like you? Yes. Well, it, it keeps the lies flowing, you know. It's a, we're, things remain fluid. Um, I think everybody's mics is live, right? Yep. So we just, you know, pick them up when you want to go. But let's start with Vince and uh, oh, you want to do try it. This end. All right. Uh, pick up your mic. mic. Even though I can hear myself. Now I can hear myself even worse. Okay. All right, my name is Vince Linkstead, and I, I run the website uh, somuchstuff.com, and it's full of this kind of stuff, lots of documentation about, uh, basically, I try for all things PDP-8, um, but one of, the, one of the cool things that I spend a, an inordinate amount of time on is trying to document all of the little flip chips that uh, many models of the PDP-8 we're built out of, and a few models of the PP11 and other stuff. Um, anyway, uh, so for instance, in this wad of paper is at almost every variation of the M220, which is a two-bit slice of the PDP-8 architecture. Uh, the only version that is not documented in there, oh, that's going on on the floor, that really helped. Um, is actually a re-implementation in a double height card like that that has just this chip on it. And um, the, all the logic basically collapses into that chip and then there's a, like one pull-up resistor. So anyway, and then I also have drawings for the 8L, 8I, and some of the older chips, flip chips, just lots and lots of that kind of thing. But I'm not wasting time on that. I crank out these boards. One of them is down there. Um, that, that board is uh, an implementation of the 32K RAM. This is a battery back to pass RAM that, uh, thank you. Um, I did a version a few years back, uh, but the 32K SRAM is over here. And then this bit over here is uh, Roland Hoisman's um, bootloader thing. So essentially there's a re-implementation of an Arduino here, and the Arduino knows every PDP-8 bootloader we can find, just knows them all. And uh, you set the little default here, and you flip the SW switch, and that's the bootloader you get. And uh, very, very cool. Uh, another, another neat side effect of the way he's done it is he chatters out the debug port here, which I never bothered to put anything on because it's kind of boring. But anyway, he chatters out the debug port, which slows it down enough that the lights are dancing as he toggles in the bootloader and prepares to execute it. But he's also outputting on the debug port, which is what's making it slow enough that you can actually see it. And so anyway, that's kind of fun. Um, this one I brought is a board that is trying to be space war. So it, there is a two board set that is uh, the VCAD, and uh, the two boards here have been collapsed. All the logic has been collapsed into the uh, CPLD, and uh, the DDAs have been re-implemented up here instead of as a giant board full of uh, resistor ladders. And if I can interrupt, the, the Space War board was one of our first test cases for writing Verilog for this particular ATF 1508 CPLD. 
by using Quartus 2, we could synthesize Verilog and then convert the output file to target the Atmel uh, CPLD, which is no coincidence because the Atmel CPLD is actually just a more or less re-implementation of a previous Altera part. More or less, Alan, yes, there are minor changes, but it is more or less uh, perfectly compatible. More or less, if I didn't make that clear. Thanks, Alan. And then the last example that I brought of things I've been working on is uh, some time ago now, actually, I uh, did this re-implementation of uh, Warren Stern's flip chip testers. So these same flip chips that I'm documenting on my website, uh, this device, you can plug them in in the socket on the top there, and uh, on that edge uh, is a Raspberry Pi that will drive test vectors in and out and uh, tell you whether that flip chip is actually working. I'm working on and having miserable luck with a negative logic version of this tester as well. Uh, not a lot of progress to report there. So anyway, that's what I've been doing most recently. Okie doke, and also you should mention that um, part of Roland's bootloader also is running diagnostics. So he's got a bunch of the oh, toggle in yeah. diagnostics RIM and bin loader, and I think that's about it at this point, right? Yeah, and basically the cool stuff that you might have had to f t uh, read in with your RIM loader or whatever, um, he can just put it in the Arduino and you can just select it, and voila. Okie doke. Jimmy? Hello, my name's Jimmy. Um, I like hacking on uh, vintage hardware, and uh, I recently uh, got into the um, PDP-8 architecture. Um, and uh, so my interest is in a lot of like microcontroller systems and or microprocessor systems. And um, uh, Jonathan Chapman, uh, Glitchworks, um, got me into the Ohio Scientific uh, series of machines. Um, and one of the boards that the Ohio Scientific uh, Systems has is the 560Z CPU lab. Um, it basically lets you have an IM6100 uh, PDP-8 on a chip along with a um, Z80 on a board that uh, the host 6502 based system can uh, uh, emulate all the I.O. calls um, and uh, load programs into it. So. Um, what I've been developing is the driver package for the 560Z's um, IM6100 on board um, so that it can uh, emulate the, um, the teletypewriter calls that the uh, PDP-8 might make, the um, uh, memory extension unit, um, basically anything that uh, might make an IoT call. Um, so the current stable version of this driver package um, I have it all pulling the status registers of this, uh, the board, um, but I'm in the process of uh, revising it to be interrupt driven, which should let me actually utilize the memory extension emulation and hopefully get uh, OS 8 running up uh, on the system. So uh, I do have a website, tangentideas.info, that I rarely update, but uh, hopefully any progress on this I'll uh, be posting on there. Um, or the OSI web forums, so. What did people do with this board back in the day? Um, so you could load um, Focal on it, um, and I actually had it running Focal out in the um, the presentation or the um, the floor there. Um, they could also just kind of like debug PDP-8 software because you can one step this and uh, examine um, the memory of the uh, PDP-8 bus. Um, uh, sort of stuff like that. Um, I would like to eventually, um, if I ever get my hands on a real PDP-8, I'd like to sort of do like an inverse of this where I have like a 6502 based system on a Unibus board that is able to emulate those IoT calls that the host PDP-8 would be making. 
Um, so you could have like a uh, teletypewriter emulation or memory extension or um, like a graphics plot or whatever else. How do you interface to, between the OSI and the 8? Is there an omnibus connection? Um, so this on this board here, mm -hmm. or so this doesn't actually interface to a, a real PDP-8. Um, it's the uh, Intercell IM6100. Right. Um, so the IM6100 has like 12 data slash address lines. It has a strobe to select between like, is it data on the line, is it address? Um, and then it has some uh, control lines for um, when it's in IoT mode. Uh, so you can like modify the accumulator of it, the um, like tell it to skip over the instruction, um, all sorts of features like that. So when you're running Focal or when you're looking forward to running OS 8, you're loading serial over the TTY port? Uh, so when I am loading the software into it, um, the host 6502 system, um, I wrote a, a bin loader for that that just loads the bin uh, paper tape image directly into the PDP-8's uh, memory. Um, I can then have the, um, using some control lines, I can then tell the 6100 to start execution at a certain address. So um, I can just load whatever I want and point it at it. The PDP-8, of course, is 12-bit. The 6502 is 8-bit. Are you sharing memory with the 6502, or does it have its own separate memory for the... So PDPA. this board, um, oops, sorry. Um, so the board actually has two bus connectors on it. One's the sys side, and the other's the MOS side. Um, so the MOS side is going to be the um, the 6502's bus, and the sys side is the uh, PDP8 slash Z80 bus. So if I want to write into the PDP8's memory, um, I basically tell it to use the MOS bus as the host rather than the 6100. Um, and then I can write in eight bits of data to the lower eight bits, but then I have to use one of the PIAs and then four bits for the, the top bits, which is a little bit cumbersome, um, but uh, it gets the job done. Okay, well, thank you very much. Ethan thank lied you. to us. Uh -huh. So, uh, my name is Ethan Dix. I've been hacking on PDP-8 since I was in high school and found one uh, in, in, a, in a mud puddle at the Dayton Ham Fest. And um, this past year, I've spent a lot more time actually doing Unibus hacking than PDP-8 hacking, but um, I've been trying to get around to fixing a um, PDP-8L that I took with me to Vintage Computer Fest a few years ago in New Jersey that uh, took a power hit when somebody tripped a breaker, and it has never been the same since. So that's been my debugging project for the last couple of years. And then also, because my current job has me on the road a lot, and I can't easily put a PDP-8 in my check bag, um, I've been trying to do more software hacking, and so I've grabbed the cross-assembler that Vince has on his site and been playing with that and trying to uh, basically do some... Uh, application development on the 8. Uh, my, my goal is, as, as always, is put text adventures everywhere. So I'm trying to work on some text adventure engines uh, for native OS 8, but not a lot of progress yet. Doug, you didn't bring the uh, plotter in with you. Okay, well, then describe it. Well, how about my other project? Sure. Okay, I'm Doug Ingram, and I've been a fan of the PDP-8 since I used one in 1973 in my high school through a dial-up ASR-33. Uh, when I went off to college, we had one there, and I ended up buying that one. So I'm the second owner of a straight eight, and I've kept that running ever since. Of course, I've collected six more since then. I have a flock of, is flock a, a good term? <laughs> a family. A fam oh, I have a family of eights, yes. <laughs> um, in 75, I wanted to write a device handler, which was difficult to do. I had only a couple of the PS8 manuals. PS8 was the uh, name they gave OS 8 before they called it OS 8, Programming System 8, because obviously you couldn't have a 
operating system on a thing that wasn't a computer, parallel data processor. Um, and there was really inadequate documentation to do so. I had no sources, so I reverse engineered a couple of the, the drivers for PS8, figured out how they installed them, and then lost all of this stuff over the years. So I'm writing a book uh, on how to write device handlers for OS8. I have, I have it in a Google Doc right now that you know, anybody that really wants to look at it can, but I have examples for several character devices, and I had a, an epiphany a few weeks ago and managed to come up with a way to take a, a smart device on the other side of a parallel port and make it emulate a, as many devices as OS8 will allow, and I think that's 12 in a single system handler. So I, I have a, uh, it's, and it isn't working yet, but the code looks like it should work, and it's only using about half the space of a normal system handler. System handlers are extremely limited because you aren't allowed to use even a whole page of memory uh, for a single page. And an example of this is the RX01 handler uh, uses every word that's available and doesn't do any error checking on, on the floppy. And it only supports, I guess it does support two drives, barely. That, that's, and that's a comment in the, in the, the code. Um, hardly needed for floppies. So anyway, if anybody's interested in writing a device handler, um, this, this book will be available. It, it has in great detail how to uh, install handlers, how to write them, uh, goes through the OS8 boot process. Uh, and I, I think it's fairly clear. Would, would you say so? Kyle's looked at it. Um, I've also looked at it, and it is quite clear. I'm about halfway through. I'm starting the the block device section now. Uh, you know, in 75, there was no internet, so if you didn't have the, the correct manuals, you were kind of hosed. Um, and all of this stuff is, is in different places, not really well explained. So this all in one place. Now that's one project, and uh, I hope, hope I'll get a little more done on that before the end of the year. I can't sit down and do like Isaac Asimov and write 600 books in a row. My other project is I'm doing a replica of a CalComp 565 plotter, and, I, and I'm 3D printing most of it. I have, have it over in uh, Jack's area, uh, so if anybody has any questions about that. Uh, CalComp 565 was made by California Computer Products from 1959 to around 75, and as near as I can tell, they cost around $5,000 in 1965 dollars. So, you know, you could buy two cars or a really cheap house for the price of one of these plotters. And there aren't many left. Jack's hoarding them. <laughs> if you find one on eBay, it's generally in really bad shape, and it goes for too much. So that's about all I have for now. OK. Thanks. Kyle? You're up, Kyle. Uh-oh. Um, back in April, yeah, okay, well, I'm Kyle Owen, hey guys, uh, back in April, I had a hernia, and it was honestly from, yeah, doing something really stupid, uh, taking an RKO5 up the stairs by myself, so, uh, to any, to any one of you guys out there thinking that you're manly enough, uh, to, to get an RKO5, just ask for some help. Uh, it'll, it'll be a lot less expensive in the long run, trust me. But uh, anyways, as a result, I had some free time at the hospital and when recovering to write Conway's Game of Life for the PDP-8. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever played Conway's Game of Life on a PDP-8. It's two implementations as far as I know already exist. One is in basic, one is in focal. The focal one supports a grid of 11 by 11. That's boring. The uh, basic one is like 33 by 33, still boring. 
Uh, I wanted to use an entire PDP-8 field as the bitmap. So that is 4,096 by 12 bits of, of pixel data, which I arranged as uh, 192 by 256, if I recall. That's a little more usable. Uh, I implemented uh, the ability to, to store you know, initialization files and read them in from OS8. Anyways, all of that work is up on my GitHub. Uh, I think it's under Drovac, if, or if you just Google uh, PDP-8 Game of Life, you'll find that too. But uh, So that's out there in case anyone's interested in playing uh, Game of Life. It supports both the ASCII terminals uh, rather slowly, as well as the point plot display. How many minutes per generation? Do what? How many minutes per generation? Minutes per generation? Okay. Well, someone had to ask. Uh, way faster than focal or basic. Well, uh, sure. It, it's actually usable. Um, it's a couple of seconds generally per generation. Uh, it, is opt it is optimized, so it on, will... On the teletype? Not on a teletype, thank you. Uh, <laughs> not at 110 baht, it's not. With the, the VC80, it's pretty, pretty damn fast. Uh, with a sufficiently fast video terminal, it's also pretty dang fast. Um, but yeah, it's optimized fairly well, so it won't try and refresh areas that are all zeros and not needing to be refreshed. It, it does not use the uh, algorithms that all the modern game of life implementations use, you know, hash life and all of that. Who's got memory for that? Not, not a PDP-8. So anyways, check that out if you guys are interested. That's probably my latest real uh, software project. I also implemented a uh, Lawrence attractor to play with some chaotic systems just to exercise the floating point processor that uh, you can get apparently for a PDP-8. They are out there. Doug has one, he let me borrow his. Uh, but they are rather uncommon. Back in the PDP-12, uh, you could get the entire cabinet that was a floating point processor. That was then consolidated onto two hex-wide boards for the PDP-8A, which can fit in an omnibus uh, 8M if you remove the fans, assuming your power supply is in the rear of the chassis. Ask me how I know. So that, that is possible. So that's some software stuff, uh, hardware stuff. I brought... Uh, this is actually one that I just recently got, but this is a three-board RK8E set. I've been debugging one that I got off eBay years ago, and it looked like someone bit the, the corner out of one of the boards. Uh, I super glued some Radio Shack Perf board on it, and thanks to Vince, got a, a delay line and added the uh, resistor and other such things that were missing, and it was passing diagnostics until another pesky error came along, so that's coming along. And then most recently, I picked up a three-rack PDP-8i system, which is where this board set came out of. It's got a analog to digital converter, or KO5, a TCO1 controller for a TU55 and a TU56, and 32K of core, so it is a fairly well-to-do 8i system. Uh, unfortunately, there's some power supply issues. Here is the power paddle card that goes into the back plane. And I don't know if you guys can really see it from here, but the, uh, the cable ain't looking so good. These uh, are laminated cables that were used a lot in PDP-8s back in the day, and for that matter, PDP-10s and other such things. They really like these um, laminated flex cables. Well. It is falling apart and would probably short the, uh, the various rails together. Uh, you've got plus 5, minus 15, and minus 30 volts on here, and it is very likely that your minus 15 and minus 30 volts would short together if you're not careful. And, and the 5 volts is enough amperage to weld with. Uh, yeah, the beefy, beefy supplies. Uh, for those of you not familiar with the 8i power supply, it's a ferro-resonant. Uh, supply so it has a transformer with a, another uh, whole separate tap on it or whole separate uh, coil rather for connecting up to a capacitor about eight microfarads 
And uh, 660 volt, it's like a motor start cap. Um, so mine's dead. So I've actually got one on order and it should be here by the time I get back to Alabama. But uh, Jack Rubin actually made a uh, replacement paddle for the, uh, the 8i. So he's got the ability to solder on some uh, connectors if you want to use regular wires instead, and also gives you the added flexibility of making it a little easier to wire up a more modern power supply, which I believe is what you did. So anyways, that's a little bit about uh, some of the latest adventures. Thanks for listening. So do you and Vince have anything to say together about the Star Wars project, or is that uh, Vince covered it? I, I think we pretty well covered it. All righty. Um, you guys are all fairly pure. Then we get to these other guys, which are... Uh... Malcolm, why don't we just... Hi, I'm Malcolm McLeod from Australia. Um, I'm also interested in PDP-8 equipment. I guess I go between PDP-8s, PDP-11s, single board computers and a few other things, so my interests are a little bit diluted when it comes to PDP-8s and I don't make as much progress as a lot of these other guys on getting things done. But I've got some Omnibus machines, um, recent acquisitions and 8i. I've got a straight 8 that's waiting to get restored, so I've got a few things in the repair queue to get stuck into at some time. Um, but um, mostly just enjoy following the progress on a lot of these projects that are going on and trying to get inspired to get my own machines fixed up. The next project I'm hoping to get done in the next 12 months is to re restore an old um, Mark Sense educational system for batch processing of um, student programs in BASIC and Pascal and things like that. It was an Australian design system called Monex that ran on a CR11 card reader and PDP1104 with an LA180 uh, deck writer printer. So I'm hoping to get, I've got all the hardware bits that need restoring and various copies of incomplete software. I'm hoping to get that running, all things going well in the next 12 months. Hi, I'm Mark Matlock and I'm the black sheep of the family up here because I'm a PDP-11 person. And uh, in the PDP-11 uh, world, there's been some interesting things that have happened. Uh, one of the things, uh, I had a number of Qbus systems that are running, but uh, my Unibus systems I always had power supply problems and that sort of thing. So earlier this year, I got my PDP-1184 running, which was nice, uh, <clears throat> finally, after a while. And one of the boards that I got from George Hope, who uh, is the Blink and Bone um, you know, author and uh, did a lot of the software behind the PDP-8 that Oscar Vermeulen uh, did. And anyway, one of his latest things is this board, which is really an interesting one because it's a, um, it's a he calls it the Unibone, but it is a disk and disk controller all in one, and it will simultaneously emulate Arlo 2s, RKO 5s, and MSCP drives all at the same time. Uh, it has a, a Texas Instruments BeagleBone processor in it, and Linux is not very good at real time. So when you're trying to manipulate the Unibus signals, um, it's not fast enough. But the BeagleBone is a little bit different. It has two auxiliary real-time processors, and he takes advantage of those to actually do all the logic. So instead of doing the logic in an FPGA, he's doing it in the PRUs, and then they're talking through a memory common to the Linux system. So most of my PDP-11s use um, like uh, Emulex UC07 SCSI bus interfaces to the SCSI to SD cards, and this is about 40% faster than those because the, uh, the uh, data is being held in RAM on the Linux side and uh, maps very quickly into the Unibus side. So this has been one thing. We've just gotten the, uh, the drivers to kind of where they'll all run simultaneously. So again, that simultaneous, oh, and if you're missing any RAM in your Unibus system, you can have this emulate any missing RAM. So, if you've got an old Unibus system that's got peripherals that uh, no longer work, this one card will do lots of stuff. And when you think about the cost of, you know, like a SCSI controller for a Unibus at about $1,000, this thing is, uh, is a real bargain. Uh, I've also been working with Oscar on a range of software uh, projects for the uh, PIDP-11. Uh, over Christmas time this year, 
We got the PIDP 11s uh, up and running with the um, local ethernet of the Raspberry Pi. And so uh, we now have PIDP 11s out on HECnet, which is Johnny Bilquist's worldwide ducknet. And so uh, actually my son Chris earlier today got me hooked up to the hotel's Wi-Fi and we got a multi-net link out to Sweden. Actually it goes to Texas, then to Decatur, then to Sweden. And it's connected to MIM, which is uh, Johnny Bilquist's uh, emulated PDP 1174, which is the uh, multi-processor 1174 system. So we were logged on there, uh, having some fun with it earlier today. So a lot of software projects. One other thing uh, Malcolm didn't mention, he managed to, um, to get a few things out of a museum in Sydney that was being shut down. One of those was a Mink um, 23 system that had RLO2s. And one of the missing, if any of you are Mink, fan, Mink, Mink 11, Mink 23 fans, uh, there's a piece of software that's been missing for decades uh, that is the subroutine package for all of that. And he had two RLO2s that had that, and uh, he's got it up on his site. And um, we've, uh, I've been testing it on my Mink, and it's wonderful to have the software that, goes, that allows us to do that. Uh, the one other final thing I would say is I wrote my first RSX 11M device driver for an analog input, and I stole some code from Lee Gleason down in Houston who put the temperature sensor into the PIDP-11, so he gave me the shell that I needed, and then I stole code from David Cutler who wrote RSX 11M and his old driver from 1973, put them together, and um, so I have an ADV-11 card that I'm able to read in through RSX QIOs now, so that was a lot of fun. So, uh, but RSX is probably my main thing with kind of secondary RT11, but you know, that's what you get for being a black sheep. Green sheep, okay. Um, my turn, I guess. Okay, so uh, I've been going kind of backwards faster than usual, and what I've been doing over the last few months is more historical than, than hardware. Uh, many people in their EE courses used a book called Prosser and Winkle, or depending on when you took the course, it could have been Winkle and Prosser. Um, these are two folks, uh, one was in Wyoming, one at Bloomington, they both ended up at Bloomington after a while, who were teaching digital design to their engineering students. And in fact, the title of the book is called The Art of Digital Design. And I really don't know if that came out before or after The Art of Digital Electronics. So I, I'm not sure where the title came from, but I'm pretty sure that Dave Winkle came up with it. Basically, they used the same method that Tom Osborne used designing the HP 9100, which is called ASM, Algorithmic State Machines. And his approach is working top down from the logic that you want to have working and design, you know, letting that design the circuitry for you. So this book is a, a course in, in using that design methodology Basically, what the <clears throat> excuse me, the students did over the course of a semester or maybe a year is work through the 8i instruction set, top down from the instruction operation, and derive the hardware from that. And, and then, as part of the course, there was a lab where the guys used a thing called the LD12, which was a logic trainer that, as they just um, learned to delineate the circuits, the logic circuits, they went ahead and did them in hardware in the lab. So over at my booth, there's the prototype of the machine that they used, uh, which worked at VCF West, I think it had a witness, right? Uh, didn't seem to want to work here, but it, the lights come on. Uh, it's not my machine, it's a prototype, so I've been instructed not to fix it. Uh, so it, it's sitting there on the table. But if you're following stuff on the VC forum, uh, Marty Geist has always been an instigator of strange projects. He started building one of these things on his own in wire wrap, which was the way the original was built. Uh, Dave Robbins in England picked, him, picked up the project and did a circuit board for it. So now, uh, if you want to join in, those boards are available. Probably uh, about 40 bucks delivered here in the US. There'll be two boards in the set. Um, I've got the logic board over in my booth you should be warned if you get into the project, you're looking at probably another couple hundred bucks in wire wrap sockets. So it's, it's not a cheap project, but it's a super learning opportunity for the 8i. So uh, if you're interested, let me know. It's, uh, are you guys all 
if you're interested in the eight stuff on the forums, the VC forums, or aware of them, I take that as a yes. Uh, so you can follow up on details there, or else check me at the booth. And I think, uh, unless there's heckling or input from the audience, that's probably it, right? I just had one question about that uh, modern recreation board. Yeah. I was looking at the RAM field. The, the, the prototype you've got is using 2102 1K by 1 S RAMs. Yeah. Um, and I was looking, there are 20 pin, 12 20 pin RAMs. What are the yeah. RAMs on that one, the new one? Um, I forget what they are, but it'll be 16K a RAM. So it'll be actually uh, the 4K machine would run focal. This should run something better, OS 8 ish, maybe. Yet to be proven, but that's the goal. So uh, it, you'll end up with a functional 8i. You guys, anything else? Anything from the folks in, out there? User land? Yeah. Um, so one other thing on the Unibus side of things, uh, George Hope, one of his other projects, he calls Uniprobe, OK? And so this is one of the circuit boards for a Uniprobe. Um, basically, it brings all of the address lights and data lights, so it's, it can replace the, um, the bus terminator, but give you a visual indication of kind of what, what's happening data-wise on it. And then it's also got six or th five 16-pin cables that goes over to another little board that then you can plug your logic analyzer in and have a really clean, uh, basically, USB to your laptop uh, for the logic analyzer. And the particular logic analyzer he's using is a, like a $400 one that's a 34 channel. And so if you wanted, if you, if you have a Unibus computer that you needed to get at logic analyzer wise, uh, this is a really slick way to do that. So. And uh, Jorg has allowed that there might someday be an Omnibone. Uh, I don't believe him, but <laughs> it, it's a possibility. We should be he's applying. You 11 guys, you know, always whining. Uh, but hopefully we could get him on the 8-bit or the 12-bit side. We'll see. Otherwise, it's up to you guys, I guess. Um, okay, so that's kind of our wrap. Do we need to do a clack at the end, too? Okay. Then uh, thanks a lot, and we'll try and bore you again next year. So, cheers.